So now let's also revisit a little bit this notion that we can have sand in fractures at low stand. So the idea is that at low stand, if you are in semi-arid condition, you can have a little bit of dissolution enhancement along the fractures. But then as the sands come in, if you are in a situation that you're actually close to the hinterland, you'll tend to have fractures that are more filled with sand. If you are in a situation where you are closer to the reef, but still kind of in the hinterland, then you will have a little bit less sand perhaps. So you'll preserve some of the porosity. And of course, if you are in a situation where you are closer to the reef and maybe even not, not exposed for very long, you have higher potential to preserve this karstic porosity. Now during transgression, you rework the low stand deposit and typically if you had not filled completely some of those fractures, the one that were closer to the reef, that's where you start having mixed carbonate clastic feelings. And you remember we saw evidence of that at the outcrop in discrete beds where we had both deposits. So marine uh, foraminifers mixed with Aeolian sand that represented the low stand deposit reworked during the transgression. And during high stand, sea level rises up, so the whole system is, is now underwater again. What happens is you deposit limestone on top, but what's interesting is you still have this, um, th this process of differential compaction, which basically means that you can have motion, um, tectonic motion along those planes of weakness, the existing fractures, so you can have displacement, and that's completely healed by the carbonates on top which is very interesting to see out the outcrop because you can see fractures and then you lose your fractures as you try to follow them up. And this is significant and characteristic for early fractures. And during the high stand, what you tend to have is a carbonate infilling into the cavities that were deposited uh, on the reef or close to the water edge. But also you have a tendency to have more dolomitization during this reflux dolomitization closer to the land, but the fractures acting as deviation zone, you have less dolomitization in zones that are behind the fracture as the dolomitizing fluid again will be shunted away from the site of diagenesis. So let's look at the concrete example now. This is the Yates Oil Field, and it's uh, in Texas in the subsurface in the Midland Basin and it's in the San Andreas Formation. And the Yates Oil Field is interesting because if you look at the gamma ray here and the caliper, which indicates the size of the well, and, and you also um, get your eye uh, trained on the, uh, the density, you can see that we have areas where the density is essentially the density of water and where the caliper indicates that we have big cavities. And really what we see here in the San Andreas Formation is what's interpreted as collapsed caves. So here's a reservoir, an old reservoir, where collapsed caves, collapsed karstic system along fractures play a, a significant portion of the porosity. So a significant volume of the reservoir is karstic caves. And this is not unique to the San Andreas Formation. You can find this in Southeast Asia. Uh, you can find this in, in many carbonate reservoirs where karst plays a role in being part of the reservoir structure. And of course, then you, you need to understand the distribution of karst, which is more complicated and follows the, the pattern of fractures than just the distribution of sedimentary bodies. So how does a buried cave reservoir works? Well, first you need to form a cave and most caves start their lives as a, a water-filled phreatic tube. So that's in the phreatic zone. But eventually the water table goes down and so now we are in a vedo zone. In a vedo zone, because you no longer have water in the tube, you start to be in a disequilibrium condition. And to reach equilibrium back, what you have is collapse from the rooftop. So you have blocks collapsing from the rooftop and you form a nice cavity, a nice cave. That's typically where uh, cavers would go and visit. But now with compaction, with burial, what you see is an increase in pressure, mechanical compaction and the collapse of this cavity. So in the subsurface, we do not expect to find those large cavity because they will have collapsed. 
Nevertheless, in those collapsed cavity, you have a lot of breccia porosity. And it's the breccia porosity that creates the reservoir in the case of the San Andreas Formation and the case of similar deposits. And of course, you can also have later on in the process rebreciation. So you can have rebreciated chaotic breakdown breccia, which basically uh, is also uh, still preserving potentially some porosity. So that brings me to my conclusion for this class. What have we learned? Well, we've learned that early lithification of limestone means that they will not compact, but it also means that if we have differential compaction, you have a high likelihood of early fractures. And early fractures are quite common in carbonates. Early fractures can act as conduit for fluids. So that could be meteoric fluids in the case of carstification and karstic deposits. And in fact, this is the case behind me in Jebel Madar, but it can also be a conduit for much later fluid that are circulating during burial. And we've seen the case of the dolomitizing fluid in this particular system of the Guadalupian. Karstification is using often fractures. It, it follows fractures but it also modifies the permeability of the fractures because it can enhance the fracture size, but then in filling by sediments during a different stage of sequence, the sequence stratigraphic cycle can reduce that porosity and that, that permeability of the fracture. So it is, it's a complex interplay between early fracture, fluid circulation, dissolution, precipitation, and sediment infilling. And we will see that these early processes can template later diagenesis in our next class when we explore the, the later stage of burial diagenesis.